Long before he was a well-known politician, Abraham Lincoln gave a speech. It was actually in 1838 in Springfield, Illinois, in which he said something that was very similar to this. America will never be destroyed from the outside. If we ever lose our freedoms, it will be because we destroyed ourselves. About a century and a half later, the great historian Will Durant, writing a book about the Roman Empire and its rise, its dominance, and its ultimate disappearance, said something very similar. A great civilization is not conquered from without until it has been destroyed from within. The essential crisis of Rome's decline lay in her people and in her morals. It's a great reminder for any nation. It's a great reminder for our nation that our greatest threats do not come from external nations, nations out where other things determined as they may be to bring us down. We've just gone through reminding ourselves of September 11th and all that was involved in that particular occasion. But our greatest danger comes from within. But I'm not really much interested in politics this morning. I'm interested in God's people and God's concern and God's works. If it is true that that is the case with nations and people groups, it is all the more true of God's people. The greatest danger to God's people has never been from Assyria or Babylon or the Egyptians unbelievers of all different kinds, it has been from God's people forgetting who they are, not living out their identity, and beginning to fall prey to the pressures to just sort of conform and go along and fit in. Greatest pressure that comes on us today in a very changing external environment is not what the external pressures will be, but who we will be in the midst of that. And so there's an identity crisis right at the heart of what it means to be a Christ follower in this modern world. It was always that way for Israel in the Old Testament, and this morning we're going to look at a particular place where that whole issue of a crisis of identity came front and center. It's a very different context than we as the church of Jesus Christ. Face. And yet it's very similar in other ways. It takes us back in a very different kinds of context, and yet it's a challenge to us to think through what Ezra encountered and what we need to learn from him. Now let me remind you of the story. God had placed it in the heart of Cyrus, the most powerful man in the world, the leader of the Persian nation which dominated the Middle East and sort of the center of the world at that particular time, to allow the Jewish people who'd been taken and deported from Jerusalem, Jerusalem had been destroyed, Judah had been ended as a country, and to allow them to return back. And so in the year 538 BC, 50,000 Jewish people, only a tiny, well, a, 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 a small proportion of the people who'd been deported and removed from the nation, chose to return under great pressure to rebuild the city and to restore the temple and build the temple and be God's people in God's land once again. It took great courage to do that. By the year 515, the temple had been rebuilt and there were things coming in place and yet there was enormous external opposition and there was problems within the people as they went back. So, 80 years after that first return to the land, God laid it on the heart of a man named Ezra person who'd achieved significant standing in the Persian Empire and had access to the king, and he was a scribe, a man committed to learn the word of God and to, and to study it and to do it and to teach it, we're told, laid it on his, his heart to go back, and not to go back on his own, to take a group of people back who would kind of be a boost to what was going on and put them on a new course and a new direction as he went back to teach the word of God. And we've seen how that developed. God opened the heart of, uh, of Artaxerxes, who's now the king of Persia, 
not only gave him permission to go back, he opened the royal vaults and virtually paid for the whole expedition and sent them back with authority and with power as they went back convinced that the hand of God is upon us for good. And so we followed them back, and in chapter 8 we saw that 90, 900 pardon me, mile walk as they took 5,000 people through desert, through enemy territory, and they finally arrive, and they're there in the land. And after four days, they have this great celebration that they've made it back. Now we come to chapter 9. And actually, there's some time in between. We'll look at that in a moment. But if you have your Bibles, let's read Ezra chapter 9. And verses 1 and 2. After these things had been done, the officials approached me and said, the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the lands with their abominations. From the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Paradites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. For they've taken some of the daughters to be wise for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy race has mixed itself with the peoples of the land. And in this faithlessness, and I think it's a better translation to say because of this unfaithfulness, because they've been unfaithful to God, not just simply faithless, but unfaithful. Because of this unfaithfulness, the hand of the officials Pardon me, and in this unfaithfulness, the hand of the officials and the chief men have been foremost. Now, as you read verse 1, it might seem that this happened right away. But as we look back and we put some pieces together, we discover that in chapter 7 and verse 9, they arrived back in the land on the first day of the fifth month. And when we go into chapter 10, which follows on this story, as a matter of fact, comes three days after this story, they're on the 20th day of the, of the ninth month. So there are, in fact, four months, four and a half months between the end of verse 8, chapter 8, and the beginning of chapter 9. So... That's all been, as it were, abbreviated after these things had been done. And the question is, what was Ezra doing in between? And we're never specifically told. But almost certainly, he'd come back to study the, the, the law, to do the law, and to teach the law. And as we begin to read between the lines here, it's obvious that these people have been confronted with the law of God. As a matter of fact, that's what they're quoting when we get to this accusation against them. It's almost a verbatim a quote, as we'll see in a few minutes, of Isaiah 34, of Exodus 34, or of Deuteronomy chapter 7. And also, if you read ahead just a little bit, in verse 4, you'll notice it talks about those who are here are people who are trembling at the word. So they've been so affected by what Ezra's been teaching that the word of God has been come. What has Ezra been doing? He's been teaching the Torah. He's been teaching God's law. He's been communicating God's word to the people who are there. And God's word not only gives hope and truth, but it also gives light in this kind of way that I'll never forget when we lived in our first house in Dallas, our first apartment in Dallas. We moved in with all the excitement of people who've been married for two and a half weeks or three weeks, and we moved in to have our first apartment there. And then when we got in after a little while, Elizabeth discovered there were other inhabitants in the apartment as well. And we began the season of cockroaches. And there were, every time the, she would turn on the light, she'd see cockroaches going in different ways. Now, Elizabeth is very Easy going, she doesn't get up, but cockroaches were something else. Uh, she never made peace with the cockroaches that were there. And the light would come on and they'd all scurry into different places. So that was our great experience with the light exposing things that we didn't want to know were there. That's what happened. 
God has exposed something in the life of this people in the light of the word of God, and they're reacting. That is what teaching always ought to do if it's taking the word of God seriously. Not only show the things we want to see, but also exposing the things that we'd like to keep hidden or pretend aren't really there. So you'll notice what happens. In the light of what they've heard from the word of God, some of the leaders, and it says the officials, but it's obviously, this is only a small group of the officials, come to Ezra to say, listen, we've learned something good about who we are. It's tucked away there, but you'll notice in that statement, it talks about the fact that the holy race has mixed itself. The holy seed is literally the word that's given. We're, we're a special people. We're people, as the law said, as he was going through Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, we're a people who have a covenant with God. We're a people who God had called Abraham and we're called to be a blessing to the nations and we're called to have a place and God has made promises to us and he's called us to be a holy nation. We're not a people like other people in chapter 7 of Deuteronomy, which we'll quote in a little bit. He makes it very clear. It wasn't because you were better than other nations. It wasn't because you were stronger or wiser than other nations. God loved you because he loved you. So on one side, they've heard a great truth. They are God's holy people. And because they were God's holy people, what was going on in their nation was utterly opposed to all that God desired. So the complaint is the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the peoples of the lands. We're losing our distinctiveness. We haven't separated themselves from the abominations of the Canaanites, their idolatry, their immorality, their practices. And then they are named the Hittites, Perizzites, Jebusites, Ammonites, Moabites, the Egyptians, the Amorites. And the specific issue is they've taken some of the daughters to be wise for themselves and for their sons. So the holy race has mixed itself with the peoples of the lands. Now, let me uh, just read two passages and you'll discover where Ezra had been talking. Exodus chapter 34, in the midst of God giving the covenant to the people. And he says, observe what I've commanded you, verse 11, this day. Behold, I will drive out before you the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Termites, whatever. Take care lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land to which you go, lest it become a snare in your midst. You shall tear down their altars, break their pillars, cut down their Asherah, their goddesses, for you shall worship no other god. For the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous god. Lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and then you whore after their gods and sacrifice to their gods, and you're invited to take care, to eat of his sacrifices, and you take some of their daughters for your sons and their daughters. Go after their gods and make your sons go after their gods. In Exodus chapter 7, uh, pardon me, in Deuteronomy chapter 7, I had trouble last week, you remember, with Esther and, uh, and Exodus and getting them mixed up with Ezra. And uh, I phoned Joe Biden this week and he said, no, don't worry about little misspeaking <laughs> things. So uh, you'll just have to put up with it. In chapter uh, 7 of Deuteronomy, he uh, goes on to say these same things, and it's almost identical to what we've had. I won't read all of the passage that he says, but just to say, you shall not intermarry with them, giving your daughters to their sons, or taking their daughters for your sons, for they would turn away your sons from following me to serve other gods. You are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possessions out of all of the peoples who are on the face of the earth. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love upon you or chose you for you were the fewest of the people. It is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers. 
So the central issue was that they were directly disobeying the command of God that they were not to intermarry with these other nations. Now let's step back from that because it's very important that we understand. This is not an issue of race. It is an issue of religion. This is not an issue that somehow or they are the superior people. You're not worthy more than the other nations are. It's because God chose you for his own purposes. It isn't because they were somehow polluting physical blood. All of those kind of ugly, evil ways in which some have used in history this to speak against mixed marriages and those kind of things have nothing to do with what is being said in this particular passage. It is talking about polluting the worship of God. When, when Naomi converted, she married into Israel. When Ruth converted and followed the Lord, there was no problem with Boaz taking Ruth as his wife. So in that case, the issue here is they will take your heart away. They will call you to themselves. This was a sin that persisted in Israel. It had been present before Ezra is standing, looking back on the past and thinking, this is what's happened to us. We've lost our distinctiveness. We began to intermarry and all of a sudden we were having Baal shrines built up to convenience the others. Ahab even had Jezebel who came down from Tyre, the, the daughter of the high priest of Baal worship up in Tyre and she was on the throne. And, and every time we did that, disaster occurred. It touches something very deep, the whole issue of marriage, obviously, and children. And we'll come back to that in just a moment. This is an emotionally, well, it's what would be called the third rail kind of thing related to the political concept that there's a, an electric wire going down. If you touch that, things are going to go off. This is, this is going to be an ongoing problem. It's going to come back in, in Nehemiah's time. It's going to come back in Malachi's time. Intermarriage had a strong pull on the people. We're small and their eyes were on other places. But the issue is here, Ezra is hearing, and it's the leaders. It's the ones who should know best, the priests, who needed to be able to trace their ancestry directly back to Aaron. They're the ones who are leading us into this pattern of assimilation. Now, I just want to back away from this for a minute. Because the issue here is different in form but it's very important in terms of its other forms for us. Then the issue was intermarriage with pagan wives because men would take the initiative in that particular case. And the point is, they'll not just affect you, they'll affect your children. Interestingly, the opposite side of this is when we were in United Arab Emirates years ago, we heard that the most powerful witnesses for the gospel were being given by Filipino women who were coming over to serve as nannies to very wealthy Muslim families. And the nannies were Christians. And they would be sharing the gospel with the children. God has interesting ways of getting around. But in this case, it's going the entirely opposite direction. They are being influenced and their children will be influenced in the wrong direction. Now, there were some practical reasons why you want, might want to intermarry. Because when you intermarried with a clan of the people who were there and they were your enemies, all of a sudden you now had a marriage alliance. You had a basis of maybe if we intermarry, there won't be these tensions between us well, because we'll be mixed in together. It will be easy for, easier for us if we intermarry. It will be politically more available to us to not have these tensions if we mingle these lines. But the issue is loyalty to God above all and loyalty to who they were called to be. So let's change. Let's think about now. We live in a very rapidly changing moral environment, a very rapidly changing spiritual environment. And one of the challenges to the Church of Christ comes from both sides. On one side, there's the enormous temptation to capitulate to just being an adjunct to a political party. 
so that if you're evangelical, it's automatically associated that you have one set of political beliefs. Now, I don't want to mix politics in this, but I do want to say that as Christians, we have a loyalty not to diminish our biblical standards and our biblical values for the sake of political advantage and to be very careful that we do not see, become seen as just a loyal member of a particular way and listen to the way in which sometimes, quite contrary to God's word, certain things are played upon that cause us to compromise our values. Let me just challenge you with this. I want you to, it's interesting thing that statistics and statistics are great liars. And the great statistic was 81% of, of white evangelicals supported Donald Trump. Okay, I don't want to get into the politics of that, but I want to get into the numbers of it. The 81% represented self-identified evangelicals. As soon as you two asked two questions, the number went down dramatically. First of all, not whether you self-identify as, as an evangelical, but do you believe what an evangelical believes about the authority of the Bible and about uh, the exclusivity of Christ as the only way of salvation. And if you asked another question, and how often do you go to church? The numbers diminished significantly. So sometimes, and now evangelicals become a bad word in some places because it's looked at in a different way. But if you turn and look in another direction and you go to black evangelicals who are committed to the authority of scripture and who are committed to the exclusivity of Christ and the gospel, and you will discover their numbers are entirely different. Now, if we're truly evangelical, how can we differ in so many ways? We're somehow being assimilated to some foreign ideology in there. Now, I don't intend to solve that problem now, but I do want to say we need to examine ourselves and not become just followers of a political party, blindly, sometimes missing important truths, and sometimes we need to reach across. Okay, have I stepped on enough toes at this point on that direction? Let me step on another. The other obvious problem is Christians are being told, if you don't buy into our view in terms of transgender and homosexuality, you will not receive, and abortion, you will not receive this position in a university. You will not be acceptable in the business place. If you're gonna believe that, keep that quiet or don't do business in that direction. And I don't have any brief for Chick-fil-A even though, even though my daughter works there and it's her pleasure to do that. Um, the reality is because they took a stand on a particular issue, now there are boycotts everywhere in that direction. We can fall prey on, on that side and the tragedy is we can become like the mainline denominations which have given up their convictions about scripture, about the person of Christ, about the way of salvation and biblical morals and become a kind of monument to the past with nothing about our identity. There is a fight for our identity to be truly biblical in our understanding. And the issue for us isn't intermarriage, but it is assimilation. And we need to be careful. Now, all of those things have nothing to do with the way you may vote. And I'm not wanting to make a political statement, but I am trying to say, even Christian institutions that have, uh, universities and other ministries, they've been told that your funds will be cut off if you take this particular way. And some of them have already said, we can't afford to lose government money. But the issue ultimately becomes loyalty to God. And that's where Ezra is discovering. Here's this problem, and it's among the leaders of the people. So how's he going to respond? He could ignore it. I've only been here four and a half months. Don't, don't, don't throw that one on my plate. He could tolerate it. Well, it's not the best thing, but um, I mean, what's a guy going to do? He, he could justify it and say, well, that was then and this is now. Instead, he takes a very different and rather unusual course of action. So you'll notice what he does in verse 3. As soon as I heard this, I tore my garments and my cloak 
and pulled hair from my head and beard and sat appalled. Then all who trembled at the words of the God of Israel because of the unfaithfulness of the returned exiles gathered around me while I sat appalled until the evening sacrifice, which would be late afternoon. I'm not told how long that was. But what's he doing? As he's tearing his garments and pulling out his hair and pulling out his beard in this particular, in this particular situation, that's what you do at a death. That's when you do, when disastrous news has come in your particular direction. And it's almost as if Ezra is saying, if we do this, we're killing ourselves. If we do this, we'll cease to be the people of God in any meaningful way. This, this is a long, slow, certain death. When I was a college student, there was a, a, a comic strip that was kind of a cult thing for university students, and it was called Pogo by Walt Kelly. Some of you may remember it. And in it, well, there's one famous thing when they're standing in terms of a battle, and the statement was, we have met the enemy, and the enemy is us. And that's what Ezra is saying. Our danger isn't the nations. The danger is us. Will we be who God has called us to be? Will we do what God has called us to do? Now, one of the things I find a little bit amusing here in a very unamusing passage is turn with me over, just keep your finger there, but turn with me over to chapter 13. Uh, pardon me, Nehemiah chapter 13. Next <laughs> Next book over. Now the report comes to Nehemiah that they've got a problem in this particular way and it's related to the problem of intermarriage. And uh, they come and they report the issue in verse 23. In those days I saw the Jews who'd married women of Ashdod, Amnon, and Moab, and half of their children spoke uh, the language of Ashdod, and they could not speak the language of Judah, but only the language of each people. So there's the problem there. They've intermarried, and now their children are identifying with the pagan country, not the other. And look what we have in the next. And I confronted them and cursed them and beat some of them and pulled out their hair. I've always loved that difference in temperament between uh, Ezra and Nehemiah. Ezra, my, Ezra hears the problem and he tears out his hair. Nehemiah hears the problem and he tears out their hair. Uh, remember we had it last week? Ezra said, oh no, I couldn't ask the king for a military guard. Nehemiah says, the king offered a military guard and we went with them. Men who are committed to the truth of God don't all have the same personalities. Women as well don't all have the same temperaments, but the issue is they do have a recognition of what is dangerous and what isn't dangerous. And Nehemiah also recruits a group of people. And it says as they, Ezra, I'm sorry, sits around in verse 4, they sit around him trembling at the word of God. Now I suspect Ezra, as he is writing that, is hearing Isaiah's words in his heart in Isaiah 66. You're the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity. This is the one to whom I will look, the one who is humble and lowly and who trembles at my word, who has a view of awe before me and wonder before me in his presence and listens to my word and doesn't play with it or ignore it, but trembles at it because it is God's holy word, not to be discarded, not to be rationalized away, not to be adapted to the current view of someone that makes it somehow easier to fit into normal society. Well, Nehemiah sits there for several hours, and then we read in verse Six, five and six, that he moves to prayer. And at the evening sacrifice, 
I rose from my fasting with my garment and my cloak torn and fell upon my knees and spread out my hands to Yahweh my God, saying, Oh my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift my face to you, my God. For our iniquities have risen higher than our heads and our guilt has mounted up to the heavens. For the days of our fathers to this day, we've been in great guilt and for our iniquities, we, our kings and our priests, have been given into the hand of the kings of the land to the sword, to captivity, to plundering and to utter shame as it is today. But now, For a brief moment, favor has been shown by Yahweh, our God, to leave us a remnant and to give us a secure hold within his holy place. That means Jerusalem. That our God may brighten our eyes and grant us a little reviving in our slavery. For we are slaves. Yet our God has not forsaken us in our slavery, but has extended to us his steadfast love before the kings of Persia to grant us some reviving, to set up the house of our God, to repair its ruins and to give us protection in Judea and Jerusalem. And now, O God, what shall we say after this? For we've forsaken your commandments, which you commanded by your servants, the prophets, saying, the land you are entering to take possession of it. There's Exodus and Deuteronomy again. To take possession of it is a land with the impurity of the peoples of the lands, with their abominations that have filled it from end to end, with their uncleanness. Therefore, do not give your daughters to their sons, nor take their daughters for your sons, and never never seek their peace or prosperity, that you may be strong and eat the good of the land and leave it for an inheritance to your children forever. And after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great guilt, seeing that you, our God, have punished us less than our iniquities deserve and have given us such a remnant as this, should we break your commands again and intermarry with the people who practice these abominations? Would you not be angry with us until you consumed us so there would be no remnant nor any escape? Oh, Yahweh, God of Israel, you are just. For we are left a remnant that has escaped that is is today. Behold, we're before you in our guilt. For none can stand before you because of this. Let me just walk through that prayer quickly and notice some things with you about it. I want you to notice how he begins in verse 6. Because one of the things that becomes very significant is even the way he begins to speak there. Oh my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift my face to you, my God. For our iniquities have risen higher than our heads and our guilt has mounted up to the heavens. Ezra hadn't done any intermarriage. Ezra hadn't been involved in these sins. He he could have said they, they've done this. These were the people who had been back in the land for 80 years. Look at what they've done. We've come. We're the pure. We've come. But Ezra knows, first of all, that it's not true, that he has sinned in his own way. But he also knows that he cannot stand exempt as if he is sinless and that he's part of a people and he identifies with the sins of the people of which he's a part. It, it's Moses standing before God as the people have committed their sin with the golden calf, and the Lord says, uh, you know, I'm going to wipe them out and I'll start over with you. And Moses says, no, 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 kill me. Don't take me and leave them. It's our sin. It's Daniel. In Daniel chapter 9, with all the record of what's going on and having served God faithfully, praying, it's me. We've sinned. We've done this. It's Paul saying, I would willing to be sent to hell if it meant my people would be saved. If you point the finger at people, rather than joining yourself in their sin, you will never lead them in a way that honors God. And so as a wise leader, it is Ezra saying, we've sinned. Our sins are great. Our sins are immense. The identification 
which ultimately is what the whole issue of Christ took our sins. He identified himself with our sins. And because he identified with our sins, he paid the price and we are free in him. Now the second thing here after identification is confession. And there's no shortening of the reality of what he's saying. I'm ashamed and blush to live my face before you, lift my face before you. Our sins are shameful in light of your word. Our sins are immense. We're drowning in them. Our iniquities have risen higher than our heads. Our sins have mounted up to the heavens. Lord, this is no small thing. This is a huge thing before you. And this is a persistent sin. We've done it as a people over and over and over and over again, as he says in verse 7. From the days of our fathers to this day, we've been in great guilt. And we've been punished for it. We kept doing it, and you finally led us into captivity. All of those things are true. Lord, we have no excuses to make, no explanation. Our sins deserve whatever you bring upon us. And then having talked about the faithlessness of Israel, he talks about the faithfulness of God. In verse 8, he goes on to describe, but for a brief moment, favor has been shown by Yahweh our God to leave us a remnant. You've reached into our captivity in Babylon, deserved, and you've brought back, we're, we're just a remnant, but we're a remnant, and you'd always made promises that you'd preserve a remnant And you've begun to do that, and we've come with great enthusiasm all the way here because you are working within us. You've given us a secure hold in this holy place. We're back in Jerusalem, and there's a temple once again. You've brightened our eyes. You've given us a little lightning to our days. Next year in Jerusalem was what they prayed in Babylon, and Now they're here. And then he said, not only have you done that, you've turned the king's heart in our direction. You've been faithful in moving the king. We are slaves. We're still not free, but our God has not forsaken us in our slavery, but has extended his steadfast love before the kings of Persia to grant us some reviving, to set up the house, to repair its ruins, to give us protection. And having talked about the faithlessness of the people, the unfaithfulness and the faithfulness of God, then he comes back and he he reminds himself of what God had said as the clear standard of his word. So verses 10 to 12 are really just mixing together a number of passages that spoke to this very issue. It's not as if this was something they hadn't been forbidden to doing. Now, oh God... What shall we say to this? We've forsaken your commandments, which you commanded by your servants, the prophets. The land you're entering to take possession is a land impure with the impurity of the people of the land and their abominations that have filled it from end to end with their uncleanness. Therefore, don't give your daughters. Don't take their daughters for your sons. Never seek their peace or prosperity that you may be strong and eat the good of the land and live in it forever. We knew that. You told us that. And we've gone directly against it. I'm amazed how often we can read things and you read the various literature and you'll read a book and it will say, no, that, that looks like it says this, but it clearly doesn't mean that. Yeah, it clearly says that such and such should not be a sexual practice in which people should be involved. But, and then there's always the exceptions to why God's clear command is not God's clear command. <coughs> and why we now know more than what God did when he gave it to us. It's always the temptation to adjust the word of God or not to read it properly and to justify our behavior in ways that it was never intended to be used by God, to contradict clear things taught in the words of God. Even as we go back and we think how many Christians use verses totally out of context to describe marriage between whites and blacks or other ethnic groups that had nothing to do with that and had everything to do with God's people 
not intermarrying with unbelievers to keep the purity of who they were before God. And so he comes back to end. After all that's come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great guilt, seeing that you are God of punishless less than our iniquities deserved, we deserve more than we got. I remember once when I was just beginning to pastor for some reason, I felt led by the Lord to take out a card and write on it, I, Gary Enrig, truly deserve to be in hell. And signed my name and dated it. And I'd known it, but there was something about writing it out that said, this is what I deserve. And then I wrote underneath it, but the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses you from all sin. And that's what he said. We deserved annihilation, destruction. And yet, you haven't judged us in the way that we deserve. And since you've done all of that, you've given us a remnant. Are we going to do it all over again? Are we going to fall back into those areas? Wouldn't you be so angry with us until you consumed us? There'd be no remnant, no escape. Oh, Lord, you're just. You're a righteous God. We stand before you with no claim at all. And it's the interesting thing as you look at the end of that prayer, there's no petition. There's no request. There's just, here we are. Utterly dependent on you and you're just whatever you do. Now that's not where in Christ we end. In Christ, we're always aware of God's promise, and it's not going to be quite where this story ends. It isn't enough just to confess their sins. They're confessed, but they need to deal with it, and that'll be chapter 10. But I stopped here rather than going on there because it is important that we just sit back and think. We are more sinful than we imagine that we are. And Ezra is dealing with these people and trying to help them understand and aware on his own that our sins are a greater issue than we imagine. And God is more holy than we imagine. And sin cannot be played with. Sin cannot be treated lightly as if it doesn't matter. number of times I've recently read something. Yeah, I know that the Bible says something about we shouldn't have sex outside of marriage, but God will forgive us for that. It is always the temptation to take God's grace and manipulate it for sinful purposes. Our sin is serious before a holy God. And secondly, the danger of assimilation of being corrupted, of allowing the world to squeeze us into its mold. And there's all kinds of different molds it's quite happy to be, to put us in. As long as that mold denies the distinctiveness of who we are and ought to be as followers of Christ. And so there's all kinds of molds that the world offers us to be squeezed into. And the pressure is real and it's strong. And we feel it at different stages of our life more urgently than others. But J.B. Phillips helpfully translated that verse in Romans, don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. And that's our challenge today. When we're bombarded constantly with all of the media that comes from one direction, comes from another direction, how do I, how do I keep myself right? before the righteous God and not go that way or that way. I'll never do it perfectly, but I need to take it seriously. And I need to say in Christ that we need to come to recognize that confession is an essential part of being a Christ follower. If we confess our sins, and he's writing to those who are believers in 1 John, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. But confession 
isn't enough. There must be actions that are consistent with confession. That's what chapter 10 is going to be about. To acknowledge my sin is not the same thing as turning from my sin. And so we need to hear what God is saying to us. We're in need of God's mercy. We're in need of God's grace, even as followers of Christ, to recognize that Jesus comes to the churches in the book of Laodicea and says, unless you repent, I will take away your candle. The church in Europe capitulated to culture. And that church is weak and feeble and almost disappearing. And now God's momentum in the church has moved to the global south and to other parts of the world. God doesn't need us, but we need him.